My name is Kaylin Whitefeather, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened a long time ago, almost 20 years back, when I was a teenager fresh out of high school. Living on the reservation offers a unique perspective and connection with the land, and this story highlights that deep bond. The Crow Creek Reservation in South Dakota is where my family has been for generations. Rolling hills, sparse but resilient vegetation, and the Missouri River cutting through the heart of it, that's our home. Summers are long, nights clear, and the sense of community is strong. Back then, I was like most kids around. Worked with my dad on the ranch got in a little mischief with my buddies Corey and Ben, and had a crush on Anya, the girl next door. We'd spend our days fishing, exploring, and dreaming of everything beyond the reservation lines. One Friday afternoon, after a long day helping Dad round up cattle, we decided to blow off some steam. Armed with fishing rods and a sense of adventure, we headed down to our favorite spot, an old, gnarled cottonwood tree on the riverbank. It was just past sunset, the sky ablaze with orange and pink hues. That cottonwood was our fortress, our secret hideout. Its twisted branches and weathered trunk held whispers of stories shared in games played. Casting our lines, we settled in, the rhythmic sound of the river lulling us into a half-attentive state. Remember those stories about the river monsters? Ben mumbled, his voice thick with a mix of boredom and a hint of childish wonder. Which ones, old man Johnson's tale about the one with the gator teeth? I chuckled. That was good for a laugh. Pure fiction. Nah, not that one, Ben was staring towards the opposite bank. My grandpa used to talk about something that moved under the water, quick and silent, leaving nothing but ripples when it had surface. He trailed off, his words hung heavy in the dusky air. The hairs on the back of my neck prickled. Grandpa Ben was a respected elder, a man of knowledge and quiet wisdom. We hadn't questioned stories like this before, but teenage bravado has its strange lure. I bet it was just a big catfish, Corey scoffed, pulling a bored face. But even his nonchalance couldn't hide the slight tremble in his hands. The sun dipped below the horizon, painting the water in streaks of crimson. Shadows lengthened blurring the lines between the solid world of the day and the mysteries that might reside just beyond our sight. That's when it happened. A splash, louder and more forceful than anything a fish could make, shattered the tranquil scene. It erupted just upriver from our spot, about mid-channel. Our heads whipped around, a mixture of adrenaline and a creeping sense of unease washing over us. At first, all we saw were ripples widening in concentric circles, then, something broke the surface. It was sleek, obsidian black, and impossibly fast, not the lumbering shape of a fish or any other creature we'd seen in these waters. It breached only for a moment, a long, sinuous body arcing against the fading light, before disappearing once again. We were frozen, a collective gasp trapped somewhere between fear and disbelief. What in the hell was that? Corey breathed, his usual swagger replaced by wide-eyed terror. I don't know, my voice barely a whisper. The rational part of my brain tried to make sense of it, a log, an oddly shaped rock, some trick of the light, but my instincts screamed otherwise. Even Ben, the one who started the conversation, wore a mask of shocked silence. Whatever it was, it was big, and it was definitely in the river. The sun had fully set, casting us in a blanket of darkness punctuated only by the soft glow of the stars. 
Fear settled over us, a heavy cloak that choked the carefree spirit right out of us. We couldn't see whatever lurked beneath the surface, but we knew it was there, watching, waiting. We gotta get out of here, I finally managed, a newfound urgency propelling my voice. Now. We scrambled to gather our gear, hearts drumming against our ribs. Each rustle of leaves, each crackle of a branch, sent fresh jolts of terror through us. Somehow, in the oppressive darkness, the river had transformed from a place of comfort and familiarity to a sinister expanse of uncharted danger. We didn't speak, couldn't speak. The dash back to our dirt bikes was a blur of instinct and sheer panic. As I kicked my bike into gear, I glanced back once. The river lay still and silent, reflecting the sliver of the moon. It felt like a calculated peace, the calm before the storm. We tore up the trail that night, dust swirling behind us as we raced back to the lights of the reservation. No words passed between us, no explanations, just an unspoken understanding that we'd witnessed something, unnatural. The incident hung heavy over us in the following weeks. At first, we tried to convince ourselves it was a stupid prank, a trick of the light, or our imaginations running wild. But deep down, we knew, even if we didn't admit it out loud, Something was in that river, something that did not belong to the world of catfish, turtles, and canoes. We avoided that stretch of the river from that day on. Our usual bravado was replaced by cautious respect. We talked of college and leaving the reservation, topics that had previously felt distant and abstract. We grew up a little faster that summer, bound by a shared secret and an unsettling realization that the world held mysteries beyond our comprehension. Life went on, as it always does. I eventually did move away for school, as did Ben and Corey. We went our separate ways, but the memory remained. And the questions lingered. What was that thing? We never discovered the answer. Was it a descendant of the strange beings my grandmother's stories warned against? An unknown creature that lived in the unseen depths of the river? Or was it simply something our young minds couldn't explain, an encounter blown out of proportion by fear and adrenaline? I've gone back over the years, fished in different spots, and even revisited the bend near the cottonwood tree under the glaring midday sun. Yet, the feeling never completely fades. There's a lingering unease, a sense that eyes I can't see are observing me from beneath the surface. The river, once a source of fun and freedom, still holds a hint of darkness, a constant reminder of the boundaries of our understanding. As the years stretched out and my childhood friends scattered, I rarely spoke of that night. But sometimes, when I'm walking by a body of water, or when a particularly long, dark shadow flickers across my vision, it all comes rushing back. I see the ripples spreading, feel the icy hand of fear clutch my heart, and hear the splash that shattered our youthful innocence. The incident on the river marked a shift in me. It instilled a sense of awe and a healthy dose of respect for the forces beyond our control. While some may write it off as youthful exaggeration or a simple wildlife encounter gone awry, I choose to believe there's more to the story. After all, the elders weren't wrong, there are things in this world that defy explanation things that linger on the edge of our awareness hinting at the vastness and the mystery of the universe we inhabit. So, the next time you find yourself at the water's edge, pause for a moment and listen. Listen to the whispered stories carried on the wind and the quiet murmur of the depths. For just beneath the surface, 
in the spaces between what we know and what we don't, lies the potential for encounters that can forever alter how we see the world. I never learned what the creature was. The mystery remains, an unsolved equation that both fascinates and frightens me. It's become a part of my folklore, a reminder that even in a world that seems increasingly mapped and charted, there are still pockets of darkness, creatures of the unknown, waiting to challenge our perception of reality. And that thought is both terrifying and strangely exhilarating. Years passed, filled with the usual mix of triumphs and heartbreaks, just like anyone's life. I got married, had a daughter, and built a career in environmental science. The memory of that night by the river faded, though never truly vanished. Still, whenever I was near water, an instinctive shiver would remind me of the unfathomable depths that lay just beneath the surface. Then came the summer that changed everything. My daughter, Maya, was 13 around the same age I was when it happened. Maya inherited my adventurous spirit and my connection to the land, spending every free moment hiking and exploring the nearby nature reserves. One day, she announced that she wanted to try fishing, just like I taught her when she was a little girl. Filled with a bittersweet sense of nostalgia, I took Maya to a lake tucked away in a wooded corner of a state park. It was a peaceful spot, dappled sunlight filtering through the leaves as we set up our gear on a quiet stretch of shoreline. Yet, a familiar unease nod at me. At first, our afternoon went smoothly. Maya caught a couple of small sunfish, squealing with delight each time. Proud dad moments washed over me, mingled with a lingering tension I couldn't fully shake. It was nearing dusk when it happened. Maya, determined to make one last epic catch, flung her line far out into the lake. For a blissful moment, all was still. Then, the line went taut. So taut, it felt like it might snap. But Maya wasn't reeling anything in. She struggled, the fishing rod bending precariously in her grip. Dad, help, she yelled, panic in her voice. Panic mirrored her own in my heart. That feeling, the heavy, sickening premonition that something was horribly wrong, came rushing back. I scrambled over, grabbing the rod with both hands. It wasn't a fish on the line, at least not one I'd ever encountered. The force on the other end was immense and unnatural. Maya, let go! I shouted, fear twisting my voice into a raw rasp. But she gripped the rod with surprising strength, the knuckles of her hands white against the dark fiber of the pole. Whatever was down there yanked, a burst of power so terrifying the rod snapped in two with a sickening crack. Maya screamed and stumbled backward, landing hard against the stony bank. I dove for her, my mind screaming incoherently as the surface of the lake erupted. No splash, this time. A massive shape surged upwards, a glistening arc of dark, scaly flesh dwarfing our tiny forms. My vision zeroed in on details, a cavernous maw that could swallow a person whole, eyes that burned with a cold, primeval intelligence, and impossibly long claws that tore through the water like blades. Before I could process, it was gone again, the lake churning in its wake. Maya lay sobbing by my side, shock painting her young face pale as death. I cradled her, my own body shaking uncontrollably as the creature's image seared itself into my mind. There was no mistaking it. The sleek form, the monstrous size, those eyes. It was the same creature from the river all those years ago. Only bigger. Stronger. 
far more terrifying now that it was an immediate threat. We ran. Ran blind through the trees, fueled by a frantic, animal desperation. Scratches tore our skin, breath burned in our throats. Stumbling out of the park, we managed to flag down a car, babbling incoherently about monsters and the lake. The people inside were kind, but looked at us like we were crazy. That night began a nightmare. Local authorities searched the lake, of course, but found nothing. Nothing that could explain the snapped rod, Maya's terror, or my own bone-deep certainty. News stories reported it as a potential animal attack, maybe a bear or large alligator that had wandered off track. But I knew. In the darkest depths of my soul, I knew. Life, perversely, went on. But it was irrevocably changed. Maya retreated into a terrified silence, nightmares robbing her young eyes of their brightness. I was a different person too. Haunted. Each body of water, pond, stream, even the bathtub, became a potential portal for that monstrous presence to emerge. Sleep became my enemy. When I did manage to drift off, I'd jolt awake in a cold sweat, the chilling image of that maw, those claws, swallowing me whole. Work suffered. My relationship with my wife frayed and eventually snapped. I couldn't expect her to understand, to live under that constant, crushing weight of fear. The worst part is the helplessness. There is nothing to fight. No weapon could harm that creature, no wall could keep it out. Knowledge became my only defense, an obsession born of desperation. I devoured research on cryptids, local legends, old texts. Nights blurred into days on flickering computer screens. And I found some things. Scattered tales, chillingly similar to ours, woven into the history of other water-rich places Loch Ness, Lake Baikal. Hints of sightings stretching back centuries, whispered stories of entire villages disappearing without a trace. I was not alone in bearing witness to the inexplicable. I won't tell you I discovered the answer, I didn't. What that creature is, where it came from, why it remains hidden, I may never know. That mystery lies as deep and impenetrable as the lake itself. This is where it ends. Not with a neat conclusion, not with a monster slain or a puzzle solved. Instead, it ends with my ongoing battle, my search for a way to live in a world where such creatures exist. It ends with Maya's eyes, still holding a shadow of what she saw, and my fear that she'll always carry that burden. It ends with a world that's a little darker, a little less safe, a little more uncertain than I ever believed possible. And somehow, in the face of that, the necessity to find the strength to keep going, because what other choice is there? My name is Kalen Whitefeather, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened 10 years ago, when I was a teenager, and it still makes my hair stand on end. My family always spent the summers at my grandparents' reservation. There was a big lake where we would swim and fish, and it was surrounded by miles of untouched forest. I loved it there. I felt a connection to the place, a sense of belonging that was unlike anything else I'd experienced. I would often spend hours hiking the old hunting trails, just soaking it all in. That particular summer, my cousins and I had decided to camp out in the backcountry for a couple of nights. My dad's brother, Ethan, was a skilled outdoorsman who had often taken us kids on these kinds of adventures. But this time, he wasn't able to come along. 
Since we were older now, it was decided that we would go alone, although Ethan insisted on helping us plan our route. Take the North Loop, he said while pointing at a map spread out across the kitchen table. Less traffic, better campsites, good spots for fishing. My cousin Kiana wrinkled her nose. Are you sure it's safe? Mom said she heard something about some missing hikers. Ethan chuckled. Ah yes, the wilderness will eat you alive. Don't listen to your mother. It's perfectly safe. Just remember, you stick together, make a lot of noise, and don't do anything stupid. My other cousin, Mateo, grinned. Like feeding bears? Got it. We all laughed, but a small voice in the back of my mind began to worry. The first day of our trip was glorious. The weather was just right, and we set up camp overlooking a small stream. After grilling some fish over a fire, we crawled into our tents, ready for a good night's sleep under the stars. I don't know what woke me up. Perhaps a strange noise or a shift in the air pressure. But I sat bolt upright in my sleeping bag, my heart pounding. Something wasn't right. The whole forest seemed to be holding its breath. Then I heard it, a twig snapping just outside the campsite. I froze, every nerve in my body tingling with a mixture of fear and anticipation. Slowly, I unzipped my tent, my hand fumbling for the hunting knife my grandpa had given me. It was pitch dark, the moon hidden behind a thick layer of clouds. I squinted into the darkness, focusing on a clump of bushes where I thought the noise had originated. Just as I was about to dismiss it as a deer or a raccoon, I saw them, two eyes reflecting back at me like twin embers in the deepest night. My blood ran cold. Those eyes were far too large and far too high off the ground for any ordinary animal I knew. Then the creature itself stepped into view. I gasped, the knife slipping from my suddenly useless hand. It was tall, at least seven feet if not more. It moved languidly on two legs, but every now and then, it would drop on all fours. Its body was lean and emaciated with wiry, dark fur. The head was truly monstrous, elongated in a way that made me think of a wolf, but larger, the jaws full of sharp, yellowed teeth. I stayed very still, barely daring to breathe as this nightmare creature began to circle our campsite. Its eyes never left me, filled with an intelligence that was both fascinating and terrifying. It knew I was there. It was only playing with me, a cat with its captured mouse. Kiana! I hissed as quietly as I could. Mateo! Wake up! There was no response from their tents. The creature paused, cocked its head toward the sound of my voice, and then began to move towards me. Panic ignited in my chest. I scrambled for the knife and fumbled to get to my feet. The creature lunged. I barely had time to raise my arm before it slammed into me, knocking me backward. Its teeth met inches from my face, and a wave of hot, foul breath washed over me. I let out a yell and swung blindly with the knife, managing to cut open a gash across its shoulder. It backed off with a snarl blood dripping from the wound. I scrambled back to my feet, my heart pounding. In the darkness of my tent, I fumbled for the matches and flashlight. When the light burst on, the creature hissed and retreated a few steps, but it didn't flee. Its eyes were fixed on me, and its mouth was pulled back into a hideous grin. Kiana! Mateo! I screamed again. This time, 
there was a rustle from Kiana's tent. Kaylin, she called out, her voice thick with sleep and confusion. What is it? There's something out here. I yelled back. It attacked me. Grab something to defend yourself. More noises came from Mateo's tent too. Both my cousins emerged, looking dazed and afraid. What the hell? Mateo muttered, and then he saw it in a circle of light. Kiana let out a shriek. In the illumination from the flashlight, the creature looked even more malevolent. It crouched low to the ground and growled. What do we do? Kiana cried, her voice cracking. I don't know, I admitted. My brain was racing. Could we fight it? Could we outrun it? We needed a plan. Just then, we heard a twig snap somewhere off in the darkness. And then another. And another. The creature tensed, its ears pricking forward. And suddenly, it turned and vanished back into the night. What was that? Mateo asked, his voice trembling slightly. I don't know, I whispered. Whatever had startled the creature, I didn't like the implication that there was something else out there even more dangerous. And then fear gripped me as a realization hit me. I wasn't the only one in danger. Uncle Ethan. I gasped. He's out here. We need to get to him. We had been so focused on our own peril that I'd completely forgotten about my uncle. He'd planned a hike in along the same trail a day behind us to keep an eye out and bring more supplies. I grabbed my backpack and started shoving supplies into it as fast as I could. What are you doing? Kiana asked. We can't just leave him, I said fiercely. He could be hurt. Or worse. Kalen, Mateo said gently. There's nothing we can do. It's too dangerous. I shook my head stubbornly. He's family. That creature, whatever it is, it could still be out there. The three of us exchanged looks. It was sheer lunacy. We were teenagers against an unknown, vicious monster in the middle of the night. But then Kiana bit her lip and a flash of determination crossed her face. Okay. Okay, we'll go. But we need to make some weapons. She pointed at the fire pit where there were still some smoldering logs. Within minutes, we had fashioned three makeshift torches. I don't know if they would have been any use against the predator. But clinging to them gave me a small sense of security. We set off, our hearts pounding in time with our footsteps. The forest that had once felt like a sanctuary now seemed alive with menace. Every shadow, every rustling leaf, amplified our fear. Which way? Kiana hissed, breaking the tense silence. It was a question none of us could answer. We decided to follow the trail, figuring Uncle Ethan would likely have stuck to his planned route. Our torches cast dancing shadows ahead, but the light seemed to make the darkness beyond the fire's reach all the more impenetrable. It was nerve-wracking, but we kept going driven by a mix of desperation and a sense of duty. After what felt like hours, we came across a small clearing. There, illuminated in the stark light of the moon that had finally peeked through the clouds, was a horrific sight. Uncle Ethan's tent was in shreds, its contents scattered across the ground as though a wild hurricane had ripped through it. Dark stains painted the ripped canvas. My stomach turned at the unmistakable scent of blood. Oh, God. 
Kiana sobbed. She covered her mouth, as if to hold back a scream that threatened to bubble from her throat. Mateo stood silent, his face drained of color. I forced myself to walk closer, to examine the wreckage for any sign of my uncle. His backpack was there, torn open. Supplies, food, water, a first aid kit were strewn around. I found his flashlight a bit further off, broken from the impact of a fall. And then I saw it, a trail of blood leading deeper into the trees. We need to follow it, I said, my voice tight and strained. Kalen, no! Kiana cried, grabbing my arm. What if, what if it's still out there? We're going to get ourselves killed. We can't leave him, I insisted, tears starting to sting my eyes. Please! He would do the same for us. After a tense pause, Mateo nodded and shouldered his extinguished torch. Kalen's right. He'd want us to try. Stealing ourselves, we followed the blood trail. It wound its way through the undergrowth, a stark crimson thread in the silver moonlight. The farther we went, the worse my gut twisted. What kind of creature could have done this? What would we find? Was my uncle still alive? Suddenly, the trail ended in another small clearing. And there, slumped against a tree, was Uncle Ethan. His body was mangled, broken, and covered in ragged wounds. His eyes were open in a final, frozen expression of unimaginable terror. I stumbled over to him, a strangled cry escaping me. Kiana turned away, burying her face in Mateo's shoulder. Despite knowing deep down that it was hopeless, Despite the sickening smell of decay, I checked his pulse. There was nothing. My world swayed. This man, so strong and full of life, had been reduced to a lifeless husk by something, something monstrous. For a long, numb moment, we couldn't move. But as the first rays of dawn began to pierce the gloom, a new fear seized us. The creature had been nearby. What if it was still watching us? We have to go, I said, my voice raspy and raw. It'll be back. Leaving Uncle Ethan's body was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, but we had no choice. We ran. We stumbled through the forest, not caring where we were going, as long as it was away from that horrible place. After what seemed like an eternity, we broke free of the tree lean and onto a dirt road. In the distance, there was a small cabin. We ran towards it, pounding on the door and screaming for help. A gruff, older man appeared, holding a shotgun and looking both bewildered and annoyed. His reaction changed from confusion to alarm when he saw our state, clothes torn, covered in dirt and our faces pale with terror. We spilled out our story in a chaotic flood of stuttered words and tears. The man, whose name was Carl, didn't doubt us for a moment. He'd lived out here alone for decades and had heard stories. That thing. He muttered, a grim realization dawning. It's back. Carl made us hot drinks got us some old blankets, and called the authorities. The sheriff and a small team of rangers arrived later that morning. We told our story again, and again it was met not with disbelief but a somber understanding. There had been similar attacks in the past, hikers and hunters disappearing, their bodies found days later, if at all. Our detailed description of the creature its size, and its unsettling intelligence confirmed their darkest suspicions. They never found Uncle Ethan's remains. They searched for weeks, combing the forest. 
there was no trace, as though the creature had vanished along with its victim. We returned to the reservation, broken and forever changed by what we'd experienced. I couldn't sleep without seeing those dead, yellow eyes. Kiana jumped at every sound in the wind, and Mateo became withdrawn. Our family, the tribe, they tried to comfort us, but words seemed empty in the shadow of such monstrous evil. The local papers got a hold of the story. They ran with words like monster and cryptid, playing up the fantastical angle. But for us, it was no urban legend or campfire tale, it was real, raw, and dripping with the blood of our lost kin. The years turned, and I tried to build some semblance of a normal life. I went to college, moved away, tried to forget. Yet, it stays with me always. The image of Uncle Ethan, the weight of that secret we shared, the knowledge that there is a darkness in this world that far exceeds human understanding. The creature was never captured, never named, and never explained. The events of that fateful summer have become one of those local legends, whispered about but increasingly dismissed as the years pass. But I know the truth. I live with the aftermath. And on quiet nights, when the wind whistles through the trees, sometimes I think I hear a noise outside. Like a twig snapping in the dark. My name is Mateo Sandoval, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened years ago, back when I was just a kid running wild on the Navajo Nation Reservation. It's a story about things unseen, and the price sometimes paid for straying beyond the boundaries of what we know. The Navajo Nation stretches across Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, a vast painted landscape where canyons cut gashes across the desert and mesas rear up like slumbering giants. It's a land of old stories of spirits and creatures both benevolent and dangerous warnings whispered around campfires meant to keep the young and foolish on the right path. As a kid, I always thought myself too clever for those tales. I spent my days with my buddies, Jared and Elias, exploring old ruins and chasing skinny coyotes across the flats. We were inseparable, full of a reckless energy that sometimes spilled over into mischief. Life on the reservation has its hardships, but to us, back then, it was one giant playground waiting to be explored. One sweltering summer afternoon, the three of us were bored. School was out, chores were done, and the lure of adventure gnawed at us. It was Elias who suggested checking out Skeleton Cave. The name alone carried a thrill of forbidden excitement. It nestled in a remote corner of the reservation, far off any marked trails. The local kids whispered stories about the cave, said it was haunted, cursed, all sorts of nonsense. Of course, that made it our top destination. The journey was long and hot, even with Jared's dad's old jeep. We bounced along dirt tracks, kicking up clouds of red dust that painted the floorboards and clung to our sweaty arms. When the road gave out, we hiked the last stretch on foot, the sun beating down with merciless intensity. Skeleton Cave wasn't much to look at from the outside. A ragged hole punched into the base of a sandstone cliff, half concealed by a scrubby juniper bush. It looked far less spooky than I had imagined. Well, who's going in first? Elias puffed out his chest, a cocky grin plastered across his round face. Jared, ever cautious, hesitated, squinting into the gloom. Shouldn't we bring a flashlight or something? He had a point, as usual. 
but recklessness won out over logic. Nah, how deep can it be? I pushed past him, bravado masking a twinge of unease. The interior of the cave was damp and cool, a welcome relief after the scorching heat outside. Light filtered through the narrow entrance, revealing a low chamber littered with bones. Bird skulls, mostly, and some bits of fur that looked suspiciously like rabbit remains. Disappointment washed over me. Guess those stories were all bull, I kicked at a bleached rib cage, sending a puff of dust into the stagnant air. Maybe it goes deeper, Elias' voice emerged from further back, echoing weirdly in the enclosed space. Jared followed him, and with a resigned sigh, I did too. The cavern tunnel twisted downwards. We squeezed through tight spots, scrambling on hands and knees. The rock felt strange under my palms, almost greasy, unsettling to the touch. It started to smell as well, not the fresh, mineral smell of a natural cave, but something, musty, like old meat forgotten behind the fridge. A sliver of light pierced the darkness ahead. We moved towards it, the anticipation building again. Then, the tunnel opened up, and we gasped. We'd emerged into a vast, cavernous space. The dim light revealed a subterranean lake, the water black and still as polished obsidian. Something bobbed ominously on the surface, a bloated animal carcass or a tangle of waterlogged branches, hard to tell from our vantage point. The air hung thick, choked with an oppressive humidity and the lingering stench of decay. This place is seriously messed up, Jared whispered mirroring my own thoughts. Come on, let's get a closer look. Elias, oblivious to the unsettling vibe, was already clambering down towards the water's edge. Reluctantly, we followed. That's when I saw it. At first, it was a ripple disturbing the mirror-like surface. Then, the water parted, and a massive head rose up. It was reptilian, covered in slick, leathery gray skin, eyes glinting like yellow marbles above a wide, tooth-filled maw. I froze, the word alligator echoing idiotically in my head. We were miles from any bayou, any place an alligator had any right to be. Then it moved. The creature was immense, longer than the jeep. It surged half out of the water, revealing a thick, sinuous body. Clawed forelimbs scrabbled against the rock, sending shards clattering into the water. We scrambled back, pure animal terror propelling us. Go! Go! Jared shouted, his voice breaking. We didn't need telling twice. It was chaos, a blind scramble back through the tunnel, driven by terror. Each echoing splash from behind sent fresh jolts of adrenaline through us. I could feel its fetid breath on my neck, hear the grating scrape of its claws on stone. Somehow, we made it back to the mouth of the cave. Bursting into the sunlight, we didn't stop running until we collapsed back in Jared's dad's jeep gasping for air. We sat in stunned silence for a long time, hearts drumming a frantic rhythm, trying to process what we had seen. Finally, Elias broke the silence. His bravado had evaporated, replaced by a terrified tremor in his voice. What the hell was that? None of us had an answer. It was too monstrous, too impossible. When we finally drove back to the reservation, caked in red dust and our eyes wide with unspoken fear, we made a pact. A pact of silence. The adults would never believe us, and frankly, I barely believed it myself. It was easier to dismiss it as a freak occurrence, a trick of the shadows, 
anything other than admitting that something truly unexplained was lurking beneath the desert. In the weeks and months that followed, that unspoken oath began to weigh on me. I had nightmares, vivid and terrifying, where the creature's yellow eyes bored into mine and its dripping jaws open wide. The guilt gnawed at me too. I knew, deep down, that staying silent was wrong. So, one day, I broke the pact. I found my grandfather, the old storyteller, the one the rest of the kids thought was a bit crazy for still clinging to the old ways. He listened to my breathless description, his weathered face never changing expression. When I finished, he nodded slowly. You have seen the water monster, grandson. His voice was quiet, matter of fact. He didn't tell me I was imagining things. Instead, he told me another story. Stories of old times when such creatures were more commonplace and of the dangers they posed, not just to the body, but to the spirit. I listened, a sense of dread settling deep in my bones. You weren't meant to see it, my grandfather ended, the firelight glinting off his silver hair. And it may not be done with you yet. The weight of his words followed me. That night, when I closed my eyes, it wasn't the nightmare of the creature that tormented me, but the fear that my grandfather might be right. I became hyper aware of every creak, every ripple in the horse trough. Each time I ventured outside, a prickling sensation crawled up my spine, the unshakable feeling that I was being watched. Elias seemed to shake it off. Maybe the shame of running blinded him to the true danger. Jared, though, grew quiet and withdrawn. His usually steady hands developed a tremble, and dark circles smudged beneath his eyes. I tried to tell him, tried to warn him, but words failed. How do you explain the unexplainable? My broken promise felt like a chasm between us, widening with each passing day. Then came the morning Mrs. Nez went missing. She was an elder, well respected for her knowledge of traditional medicine. Her small cabin sat on a lonely stretch of land near the cliffs, just beyond where the reservation bordered the national park. The search parties went out combing the dry gullies and sparse scrubland. Locals, park rangers, even some volunteers from the city, we all scoured the unforgiving terrain under the relentless sun. No trace of her was ever found. No sign of a struggle, no clues at all. The whispers swirled like dust devils, monster, predator, the old stories are true. But those that dared voice such things were met with silence or dismissive whispers of dementia and age-induced ramblings. Yet, I couldn't shake the image of that vast, cavernous maw big enough to swallow a person whole. Life took on a grim new pattern. Fear, a constant undercurrent beneath the surface of our day-to-day -day existence. School, chores attempts at laughter it all felt like a hollow act that the monster might tear away at any moment. Each unexplained noise, each flicker at the corner of my vision, set my nerves ablaze. One evening, Jared didn't come home. Dusk settled into a moonless night, painting the Hogans and the distant mesas in shades of impenetrable darkness. Fear buzzed through the community, a cold, buzzing swarm beneath my skin. My parents, usually stern and practical, clung to faint strands of hope, maybe he'd run off, gotten mixed up with some bad crowd in the town bordering the reservation. In my gut, I knew better. They found his body a week later, half submerged in the reedy bank of the San Juan River. What was left of him, at least, Officials called it an animal attack, coyote, mountain lion, 
no one was sure. But I knew. The marks, the way his limbs were, twisted, it echoed the shape of that monstrous clawed hand. A silent rage ignited within me, pushing back the despair that threatened to drown me. I wasn't going to just hide or wait for my turn. I started studying, combing through every scrap of lore, every faded book about creatures of the southwest that I could find. There were others, not just the water monster. Skinwalkers, dark shamans, things that were barely human anymore. The knowledge brought no comfort, only a deeper sense of the dangers that lurked in the shadows. One moonless night, I went back to the cave. This time, I didn't bring a flashlight or any naive notions of confronting the beast. I brought my grandfather's old rifle and a heart filled with cold purpose. The fetid smell engulfed me as I entered the tunnel, the stench of death and stagnant water. Reaching the cavern, I positioned myself behind a gnarled stalagmite and waited. The lake lay still and silent as I kept vigil for hours. My eyes ached, my muscles burned, but I forced myself to remain motionless. This wasn't about bravery, it was about vengeance and, if I was very lucky, survival. Finally, just as the faintest hint of dawn tinged the horizon, a ripple broke the water's surface. The creature emerged slowly, its hulking form casting an impossibly long shadow across the cavern floor. I aimed the rifle, my hand steady, and fired. The gunshot echoed deafeningly, the recoil jarring my shoulder. The creature reared up with a roar that shook the cave walls, brackish water sluicing off its scaled hide. I fired again and again until the rifle clicked empty. For a suspended moment, I thought I had done it. Then it lunged, a force of nature barely contained by the cavern's low ceiling. I turned and ran. How I got out of there, I may never fully remember. It was a blur of adrenaline and a desperate scramble through the darkness, my lungs on fire, the pounding of my heart the only thing drowning out the creature's echoing bellow. I staggered out into the dawn light and collapsed, retching, onto the dusty ground. It was over. For now, at least. I had survived, but at a terrible cost. The aftermath is a blur. I told no one about my midnight hunt, the monster in the cave. Instead, I left the reservation the moment I turned 18. College, cities, the constant feeling of unseen eyes on my back followed me. I never went back home, not for long. Too many ghosts resided there and the fear that one day my luck would finally run out. They say the land holds memory, that old stories linger in the dust and stone. They're right. Sometimes, in my dreams, I'm still that terrified boy running from something impossible, the echoes of that monstrous roar forever chasing me into the darkness. My name is Atticus Tallfeather, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened years ago, back when I was a teenager, growing up on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana. Life on the res isn't easy, but there's a strength in community, a connection to the land, that runs deeper than any hardship. It's a land sculpted by the wind where whispering plains give way to rolling foothills, and the mountains rise towards the sky like ancient guardians. Summer days in those parts stretch long and hot. Me and my cousins, Kai and Soraya, inseparable as always, found our ways to escape the stifling heat. There's a creek that winds through the reservation, a hidden place nestled among cottonwood trees. That's where we spent most of our time, 
fishing for minnows, splashing about, making up stories more fantastical than anything Hollywood could churn out. One brutally hot August afternoon, the three of us were down at our creek spot. Bored with fishing and tired of the usual games, Kai dared us to explore further upstream than we'd ever ventured. The creek snaked its way deeper into the hills, cutting a narrow channel into the base of the foothills. The air grew stiller, cooler the further in we went. Giant boulders jutted up from the ground, some draped with thorny vines, their twisted shapes casting strange shadows. Soraya, ever cautious, stuck closer to me, her brown eyes filled with unease. This place feels weird, she whispered, her gaze darting towards the shadows. Kai scoffed, his usual bravado masking a hint of uncertainty. Don't be such a baby, there's nothing here but rocks and trees. Yet, even he wasn't quite as boisterous as usual. We pushed on, scrambling over sun-baked rocks and wading through the shallow water. The creek bed narrowed, and a sheer rock wall loomed ahead, adorned with faded, ochre-colored handprints. Ancient pictographs. Look! Kai pointed towards the rock face, excitement replacing his earlier hesitation. We peered closer. The paintings seemed to shimmer with energy, depicting hunters and strange, animal-like beings dancing against the stone. In my chest, an unfamiliar shiver rippled through me. A warning, maybe, but ignored in the face of our curiosity. Let's keep going, Soraya said, her voice small. Maybe there's a waterfall or something up ahead. Kai, always eager for adventure, charged forward without hesitation. I followed, Soraya trailing behind. As we rounded a bend, the creek disappeared into a narrow fissure in the rock. A cave mouth, dark and yawning. Kai hooped and sprinted ahead. I hesitated. Coldness, heavy and oppressive, seeped from the cave, raising goosebumps on my bare arms. Soraya grabbed my hand, her face pale. Atticus, this doesn't feel right. We should go back. But Kai was already calling for us, his voice echoing eerily from within the cave's depths. Curiosity, mixed with an uncomfortable thrill of fear, pulled me forward. We stepped into the darkness. The air inside was thick, musty, and unnaturally still. The only light filtered in through the narrow entrance, casting long, distorted shadows that danced on the damp rock walls. Our voices, muted by the oppressive dark, bounced back strangely deformed. You guys coming or what? Kai's call echoed ominously from further in. The tunnel twisted and sloped downwards. We moved cautiously, the beam from Kai's flashlight painting a small circle of dim light ahead of us. Suddenly, the floor gave way. I cried out, instinctively reaching for Soraya as we tumbled. The disorienting fall ended with a bone-jarring thud. Groaning, I pushed myself up, my head spinning. Kai was already on his feet, Soraya kneeling beside him, wincing from a scraped knee. We found ourselves in a massive cavern. Faint light filtered down through a fissure far above, creating an eerie twilight. But that wasn't the source of our horrified gasps. Bones, dozens, hundreds, scattered across the cavern floor. Animal remains, mostly, but some, some disturbingly large, remnants of a creature bigger than any I'd ever learned about in school. Then, from the deepest shadows at the cavern's edge, a pair of eyes pierced through the gloom. Impossibly large, they shone with a cold yellow light that made my blood run cold. 
A low growl echoed through the cavern, reverberating in my chest like a physical blow. The creature stepped forward. Scaled hide, glistening in the faint light, rippled over powerful muscles. A massive head, crowned with curved horns, tapered into a jaw filled with far too many teeth. Its clawed feet scraped against the stone with an unnerving hiss. Fear, pure and primal, sent a shockwave through me. It wasn't natural, whatever this was. Something old, something, wrong. Ron. The word was ripped from my throat. We turned and scrambled back the way we came, the creature's echoing snarl propelling us. Kai slipped on a patch of loose rock, landing heavily. Soraya tried pulling him up, but he cried out, clutching his ankle. I reached for them, my heart thundering against my ribs. Kai, come on. His eyes were wide with terror as he looked back over his shoulder. The creature was gaining, its massive form blurring with unnatural speed. Kai let out a sob. Go! Save yourselves. He shoved Soraya towards me, his defiance masking his fear. I wanted to protest, to drag him along, but there was no time. The creature was almost upon him. Soraya grabbed my hand, and we ran. The cave echoed with Kai's screams, abruptly cut short with a gut-wrenching thud that made me want to retch. Soraya and I stumbled through the tunnel, blind with terror. My mind was a blur, Kai's final scream, the glint of those monstrous eyes in the dark, and the sickening feeling that we weren't going to make it. We burst from the cave and scrambled away from the entrance, collapsing onto the rough ground. We sobbed, gulping for air, the world tilting dizzily around us. When the initial wave of terror subsided, a new horror rose. What to do now? We couldn't return to the reservation. No adult would believe our wild story, and to try and face that creature again, unthinkable. Our only hope was to climb higher, to get away from the creek and find a place to hide. We stumbled through the foothills, thorns tearing at our clothes, sobs mixing with sharp gasps for breath. The unforgiving sun beat down, turning the landscape into a shimmering, hostile mirror. Exhaustion settled into my bones, but desperation kept me moving. By the time the sun began its descent, we were hopelessly lost. We found a hollow sheltered by a large boulder enough to hide us from view. We huddled together, our shivering bodies offering scant comfort. Sleep came fitfully, plagued by nightmares of gnashing teeth and Kai's terrified eyes. The next morning, we woke to hunger pangs gnawing at our stomachs and the knowledge that we couldn't stay hidden forever. We started walking again, hoping blindly for a sign of civilization, a road, anything. The day stretched on endlessly. Our voices grew hoarse, throats parched. Soraya, usually so resilient, had fallen silent, her small face drawn and pale. Then, as the golden light of dusk began to paint the land, we saw it, a thin curl of smoke rising in the distance. A flicker of hope ignited within me. With our final reserves of energy, we stumbled towards the smoke, desperation fueling every step. We emerged into a clearing, our hearts sinking as we took in the scene. A crudely built cabin sat nestled among the trees, spirals of smoke rising from its weathered chimney. But it wasn't the homey cabin of a friendly woodsman. The place exuded an air of neglect, almost decay. A rusted pickup truck sat abandoned near the overgrown porch. Still, it was our only chance. As we approached, the cabin door creaked open. 
a figure emerged, silhouetted against the dim light from within. An old man, stooped and weathered, stepped onto the porch, squinting against the setting sun. Well, look what the devil coughed up, he rasped, his voice laced with a rough humor that didn't quite reach his eyes. Lost lambs, are ya? Something in his gaze, a flicker of something cold and calculating, set me on edge. Cautiously, we told him our story. The old man listened, stroking his grizzled beard, his expression unreadable. When we finished, he grunted, the sound noncommittal. Stay the night, he said finally. There's food in the cupboard. We'll figure out what to do with you come morning. The cabin's interior was as unsettling as the outside. Dust clung to every surface, and a strange animalistic odor permeated the air. The food, sparse and unappetizing, barely touched our growling stomachs. That night, sleep was impossible. Soraya lay curled against me, shivering even under the threadbare blankets. My mind whirled with unease. The old man, the remote cabin, none of it sat right. In the dark hours before dawn, a noise jolted me awake. A scraping on the roof, like heavy claws dragging against the shingles. Fear constricted my throat as I remembered the creature in the cave, its powerful limbs and unnatural speed. Atticus, Soraya whimpered, clutching at my arm. I covered her mouth with my hand, signaling for silence. The scraping came again, followed by a low, growling hiss that sent ice through my veins. Whatever was out there, it wasn't human. I eased out from under the covers and crept towards the window. Moonlight painted a horrifying scene. The creature from the cave was perched on the roof, its yellow eyes gleaming as it stared directly into the cabin. Worse, the old man stood on the porch, not in fear, but in casual conversation with the beast. His hunched posture was gone, replaced by an uncanny straightness, and his voice, now clear and strong, held a strange, echoing quality. The truth hit me like a physical blow. The old man wasn't our salvation, he was somehow connected with the creature, perhaps its master. We'd stumbled from one nightmare into another. I moved silently back to Soraya, shaking her awake. We dressed with trembling hands, hearts pounding a frantic rhythm in our ears. Easing open the back window, we wriggled through, landing with barely a sound in the soft dirt. We fled into the woods, the moon our only guide. Branches tore at our skin, and brambles clung to our clothes, but we didn't stop. Behind us, we heard a furious snarl and pounding footsteps that sent tremors through the earth. We ran until we collapsed in a hidden gully, gasping for air, our lungs burning. Dawn painted the sky in streaks of gray as we finally drifted into a fitful sleep, haunted by the feel of claws against our skin the glint of those impossibly bright eyes. The aftermath, it lingers. We found our way home eventually, but we could never explain. No one believed us. Kai is gone. Soraya and I bear the scars, both visible and hidden. And I? I see that creature's eyes every time I close mine. It reminds me of the darkness that hides just beneath the surface of the world, of the unknowable things that might be hunting us still. And worst of all, I know, maybe we'll never truly be safe. My name is Eli Redhawk, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened back when I was in high school, living on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. 
a place of wide open skies and red rock canyons, where ancient ruins whisper secrets carried on the wind. I loved exploring those lands, steeped in the history of my people. But life has a way of throwing curveballs, lessons that aren't taught in any school book. It was late summer, the kind of heat that bakes the earth dry and brittle. Me, my best friend Najoni, and our wisecracking cousin, Ben, were on a mission. Our goal, find an old watering hole mentioned in some faded journal Najoni had unearthed during his summer job with the tribal archaeology crew. Najoni was a walking encyclopedia of cultural knowledge, his mind a vault of stories and traditions. Ben was the comic relief, quick with a joke to lighten even the most serious situation. Me? Well, I saw myself as the level-headed one, keeping those two from going too far off the rails. After hours of hiking under the relentless desert sun, we stumbled upon what we thought might be the place. A weathered natural basin, almost dry, surrounded by scrub brush and towering mesas. Disappointment washed over us. We'd braved the heat and risked blisters for a dusty depression in the earth. Guess the old watering holes dry up too, huh? Ben kicked at a loose rock, sending up a puff of dust. Nijoni, however, looked thoughtful. He squatted beside the basin and peered at the ground as if reading a pattern invisible to the rest of us. Then, he pointed. Look, tracks fresh ones. My heart skipped a beat. We'd been warned about predators in the area. Mountain lions were a threat, especially with the water sources dwindling. Ben reached for the hunting knife he always wore on his belt. But Najoni shook his head, a frown creasing his brow. These ain't no lion tracks, he said. They're too big, and look at the shape. We leaned in closer. The prints were massive, clawed, and vaguely reptilian. Whatever made them walked on two powerful hind legs. A wave of unease rippled through me. We shouldn't be here. Maybe it's time to call it a day, I suggested, the voice of reason, like always. Ben, usually so quick to get us into trouble, seemed to agree. But not Najoni. His eyes were fixed on a narrow crevice in the canyon wall behind the watering hole, a potential cave entrance. Look closer. See how the tracks lead there? There was a glint of excitement in his eyes, the thrill of discovery outweighing common sense. Come on, Najoni. Maybe whatever lives there likes its privacy. I couldn't shake the feeling we were tempting fate, poking at something we couldn't control. Ben gave me a wary look but stayed silent. He'd stick by Najoni's side through fire, and we all knew it. The three of us were bound together, tighter than blood sometimes. So, with a sigh of resignation, I followed them towards the cave entrance. The shadowed opening revealed a tunnel barely wide enough for us to squeeze through single file. Najoni went first, his headlamp beam casting eerie, dancing shadows. Ben followed, then me, the taste of copper fear sharp at the back of my throat. The air inside was stale, smelling faintly of rot and wet earth. It seemed to press down, suffocating. My nerves were jangling, my instincts screaming at me to run. We were out of our element here, trespassers in a place that didn't welcome us. The tunnel spiraled down growing steeper, the rough stone cold under my palms. I stumbled, my headlamp momentarily catching on something slick and scaled, something that moved in the darkness. Ben, did you see that? My voice was a strangled whisper, 
barely audible in the oppressive silence. Probably just a lizard, he muttered back, but the tremor in his words belied his nonchalance. Nijoni pressed on, his pace quickening as the tunnel widened into a chamber. The chamber was dimly illuminated by a sliver of sunlight filtering through a crack in the ceiling far above. It revealed a horrifying scene. Bones were scattered across the floor. Animal remains, sure, but something else too, larger, with a strangely elongated shape. And at the far end of the chamber, perched on a rock ledge like a grotesque statue, was the creature itself. Scaly hide, glistening dull green in the faint light, draped over a massive, muscular frame. A broad tail, tipped with wicked-looking spines, twitched restlessly. The head was unmistakably reptilian, narrow and cruel, with eyes that flared to life, a shocking crimson amidst the monstrous form. It hissed, a low, rasping sound that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Panic surged through me, a primal, overwhelming need to flee. I stumbled backward, knocking into Najoni. Ben swore, fumbling for his knife. Our noise seemed to rouse the creature. It uncoiled, moving with a fluid speed that defied its bulk, dropping from the ledge and landing on all fours with an ominous thud. Run! The word was ripped from my throat. We turned and scrambled towards the tunnel fear propelling us, the echo of the creature's heavy footfalls behind us like approaching thunder. Suddenly, Ben let out a strangled cry and pitched forward. I looked back in horror. The creature's clawed hand had lashed out, gouging deep gashes down his leg. Ben thrashed on the ground in agony. His blood splattered the stone the coppery smell almost nauseating. Nijoni turned back. I wanted to yell at him to save himself, but instead, he did something far braver. He scooped up a handful of loose dirt and hurled it into the creature's face. It roared, a deafening sound that echoed back, temporarily disoriented. Go! Nijoni shouted shoving me towards the tunnel. With a choked sob, I ran. The tunnel was my only chance. I prayed Ben could drag himself, somehow, to safety. Ben, always light-hearted, the one who made us laugh. The guilt was a lead weight in my chest, threatening to drown me. The creature's enraged bellows chased me. Stumbling and gasping, I burst out of the cave, into blinding sunlight. Rocks crunched behind me, echoing my heart's frantic beat. I didn't dare look back, just ran, driven by terror and the fading echo of Ben's screams. I ran until my lungs were on fire and my legs were jelly. When I collapsed behind a boulder, gasping for air, I knew, deep down, Ben was gone. The creature wouldn't have let him go. The aftermath swallowed me in a haze of grief and horror. Nijoni and I told our story. The adults wrote it off as a mountain lion attack. Easier to accept the familiar than the terrifyingly unknown. Nijoni went to the healers, seeking both medical attention for his own wounds, and some way to ease the burden of what we'd seen. He became withdrawn, the spark in his eyes dimmed. I sought comfort in action. I learned to track, to understand the signs the desert hid. One day, maybe, I could find a way back, find something to fight the creature with. It wouldn't bring Ben back, but it might keep others safe. News of animal attacks in the area became increasingly common. Hikers disappearing, cattle mutilated in gruesome ways the authorities couldn't explain. 
Fear became a low hum in the daily life of the reservation, a constant throb of unease beneath the surface. Then came the day I found Najoni again. Not in our village, but miles away, at the site of another tragedy. A family missing, their campsite a scene of devastation and bloodstains that defied rational explanation. Najoni stood staring at the scene, his expression a mask of grim determination. I know what this is, Eli, he said, his voice low. It's the same creature, the one from the cave. So, we hunt it, I said, my voice steely with resolve born out of grief. Najoni looked at me, a flicker of the old fire returning in his eyes. We hunt it, he agreed, the words of vow etched into the desert landscape. The years that followed were a strange blur. We studied the old stories, learned tracking skills few still practiced, and gathered any knowledge about creatures who stalk the shadows. I married, had a daughter, tried to find a balance between normalcy and the unseen battle that raged within me. Nishoni remained solitary, driven by an ancient wisdom and a hunger for vengeance, justice, words seemed too small to contain it. The creature remained elusive. It learned, too. Attacks were unpredictable, spanning vast distances, the trail always going cold. It was as if the land itself shielded the monster, bending the boundaries of what we understood to be possible. Finally, a breakthrough. A blurry photograph snapped by a wildlife researcher near the reservation border. The image was grainy, but chillingly clear. There, luminous in the twilight, was the creature, massive, scaly, moving with inhuman speed. The hunt was back on. Nijoni and I weren't kids anymore. Our faces were weathered, lined with experience and loss. We were armed not just with weapons, but with knowledge culled from centuries of whispers carried on the wind. Tracking the creature was a torturous, slow process. It moved like a ghost, leaving behind barely a trace of its passage. We followed fading rumors, half-glimpsed tales, the whispers of terrified witnesses. One step ahead, always one step behind, the creature remained a specter haunting the fringe of our vision. Then, a pattern emerged. Sightings clustered around certain places, ancient ruins, isolated watering holes. It was as if the creature was drawn to them, connected to the land's energy in some way we could barely comprehend. We staked out one of these places, a crumbling stone structure barely more than an echo in the vast desert landscape. Days passed under the relentless sun, punctuated by the mournful cry of coyotes in the night. Our patience was stretched thin, hope flickering on the edge of extinction. On the fifth dawn, it appeared. The creature materialized out of the shimmering heat, as if the desert itself had birthed it. It circled the ruins, its clawed feet disturbing the ancient stones. My pulse hammered in my ears as I raised my rifle, finger trembling on the trigger. Nijoni beside me, silent, his focus a tangible force. The creature froze, its reptilian head raised, nostrils flaring as if sending us on the air. Its crimson eyes locked onto ours, filled with chilling intelligence. Then, with a speed I wouldn't have believed possible, it charged. Not at us, but at the ruins. With a terrible roar, it smashed into a crumbling wall, claws tearing through the weathered stone as if it were mere paper. An opening gaped, a dark passageway descending into the heart of the earth. The creature disappeared down the passage, the echo of its roar fading into an ominous silence. Nijoni and I exchanged a look. 
one of understanding, of weariness, and of unyielding determination. This was it. Our final confrontation, years in the making. We didn't hesitate. With weapons in hand and a silent prayer on our lips, we descended into the darkness, following the monster into its lair. My name is Luca White Wolf, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened years ago, back when I was still a kid growing up on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Tough place, beautiful place, with a spirit that seeps into your bones. Summers out there mean scorching days and nights filled with a chorus of crickets and coyotes calling out under a star-drenched sky. Most days, you could find me and my best friends, Tyson and Raina, out exploring the sprawling grasslands that stretched behind our houses. Tyson, always the daredevil, was usually the one to get us into scrapes, climbing too high, prodding at things better left untouched. Raina brought the steady voice of reason, though with a good dose of mischievous laughter, and I. I was just happy to be along for the ride. One July afternoon, hotter than a blacksmith's forge, Tyson led us towards a patch of land few dared to tread on the Badlands. Stark, eroded hills formed a maze-like landscape, a place where the old stories say trickster spirits roam. Even the adults warned us about wandering in there. But Tyson, with that stubborn glint in his eye, scoffed at the tales. It's all made up stuff to keep kids from having fun, he declared. Raina and I exchanged doubtful glances but let him lead the way. The Badlands had a strange feel, the air heavy and still. We scrambled through dry creek beds and around wind-carved rock formations. The usual sounds of birds and insects seemed muted here, replaced by the eerie silence of a place forgotten by time. Maybe we should head back, Raina's voice held a hint of unease. I couldn't blame her. This place had a way of getting under your skin, raising the hair on the back of your neck. Scaredy cat, Tyson teased, but the bravado didn't quite ring true. Then. Just as the thought of turning back was starting to win out, he shouted, Look at this. Tyson stood at the base of a narrow ravine, pointing to a crack in the rock face barely big enough for a person to squeeze through. Cave! Let's check it out. His eyes sparkled with excitement. Raina looked ready to protest, but Tyson was already scrambling into the crevice. I glanced at her, and the spark of defiance in her eyes mirrored my own. We weren't about to be left behind. The cave swallowed us into the cool darkness. The air inside smelled damp and musty, and a chill ran down my spine. We fumbled in our pockets for the small flashlights we'd brought along, more out of habit than expecting to find anything interesting. Tyson's beam of light swept across the interior, revealing an even narrower passageway leading further into the earth. Raina's steps were hesitant as she followed Tyson's lead. Despite my reluctance, curiosity and that stubborn urge to keep up pushed me forward. The passage twisted and sloped downwards. The rock felt strange under my hands, slippery and oddly smooth. Then, the tunnel opened up into a small chamber. We gasped. Scrawled across the walls were paintings, crude figures, half-human, half-animal, in faded reds and yellows, dancing in the flickering light of the flashlights. A prickle of fear ran down my spine as my eyes settled on a central figure, taller and more ominous than the others, with long, clawed hands and strangely elongated limbs. Think this was done by the old tribes? 
Tyson's voice had lost its usual cocky edge. My grandma says some of these places are sacred. Raina's words hung in the air. A rumbling echoed behind us, a low growl that set my teeth on edge. We whirled around, our flashlight beams cutting through the darkness. Two eyes, glowing eerily yellow, materialized at the tunnel entrance. Impossibly large, they belonged to a creature that made my blood freeze. Reptilian scales shimmered black, even in the dim light. A massive head, crowned by what looked like gnarled horns, was lowered in an unmistakably predatory stance. Tendrils of mist curled from its nostrils, catching in the flashlight beams and making it seem almost spectral. Tyson let out a choked cry that shattered the oppressive silence. The creature lunged, its speed defying its monstrous size. Scrambling backward, I stumbled, my flashlight clattering to the stone floor. Panic squeezed the breath from my lungs. Then, as suddenly as it attacked, the creature paused. Its head tilted and it let out a hiss like a snake tasting the air. Its gaze swept past us, towards the chamber wall with the strange, half-animal figures. A guttural sound rumbled from its throat, was that a laugh? Then, abruptly, it turned and vanished down the tunnel with shocking agility. Silence, thick and unsettling, settled back in. Reyna was the first to break it. We need to get out of here. Now. Scrambling to my feet, I barely noticed sharp stones cutting into my palms as I clawed my way back up the passageway. Tyson and Reyna were already ahead of me, their terrified gasps echoing back as we burst from the cave and tumbled out into the blinding sunlight. We didn't stop running until the twisted rock formations of the Badlands were far behind us. Back on the prairie, panting and wide-eyed, we huddled together, trying to make sense of what we'd seen. It couldn't have been real, could it? But the shared terror in our eyes told a different story. Finally, Tyson spoke, his voice shaky, we can't tell anyone. They'd think we're crazy. Raina nodded slowly, her usual spark extinguished. Or worse, they'd believe us. And try to, to hunt it. Back home, we made a pact, swear to silence, bury the memory of that day deep within ourselves. But it wasn't that easy. Nightmares plagued me, filled with those glowing eyes and the feel of reptilian scales brushing against my skin. I caught snatches of hushed gossip around the reservation, tales of livestock disappearing, of strange sightings near the Badlands, but nobody dared speak openly about it. Then came the day that tore away any facade of normality. Sarah, a girl from school, a year older than us, didn't come home. Search parties scoured the hills and grasslands, but there was no sign of her. The whispers twisted into chilling certainty, the creature from the cave had claimed another victim. Fear coiled within me, cold and relentless. I knew deep down that the creature was real, and if left unchecked, it would strike again. But the adults, driven by their own terror, clung to practical explanations, wild animals, runaways. They didn't see the true shape of the lurking danger. Reyna's eyes, once so full of life, had a haunted look now, a reflection of the burden we shared. Tyson had changed, too. The daredevil spark dimmed, replaced by a reckless desperation, like he was daring the creature to find him, to just end the constant terror. It was Tyson who finally snapped. He grabbed his father's old hunting rifle and announced he was going out into the Badlands to hunt the creature down. 
Reina and I tried to stop him, reason with him, but it was futile. You can't go alone. Reina pleaded, but there was a steely determination in Tyson's eyes. Someone's gotta do something, he rasped. Maybe. His voice faltered, then he straightened, squaring his shoulders. Maybe this thing only understands one language. He looked at us, silently begging for understanding. Despite our fear, we couldn't let him face the darkness alone. We joined him, armed with courage born of desperation. This time, we weren't exploring. We were marching into battle, the weight of an impossible task crushing down on our young shoulders. The Badlands greeted us with mocking silence. We crept through those desolate gullies, the rifle shaking in Tyson's grip, our hearts pounding with each ragged breath. The creature was waiting for us, I could feel it. And then, the ground crumbled beneath me. Terror and confusion as I fell, the world twisting and tilting around me. Raina's scream echoed in my ears as I plunged into inky blackness. I landed hard, pain exploding in my leg as I struggled against the crushing darkness. Scrabbling for my flashlight, I fumbled it into life. I'd fallen into a cave, or maybe a sinkhole, hidden beneath the deceptive Badlands Earth. Reyna's tear-streaked face peered down from above. Luca! Are you okay? I think so, I called back, my voice wobbling. Leg hurts, but nothing broken, I think. I shone the light around. The cave was small, unremarkable. If not for, the bones. Reyna lowered a rope, and using it as a guide, I managed to clamber up, wincing with each pull on my injured leg. Tyson stood at the top, pale but resolute, the rifle in his hands. He glanced at the bones scattered on the cave floor, a mix of animal and something else. A silent understanding passed between him and Reyna. Think this is where it drags its victims, he whispered, a sheen of sweat on his brow. We can't just leave them here, Reyna's voice cracked. Somehow, in the midst of our own terror, compassion found a way to bloom. It took hours to gather the remains carefully and create a makeshift burial place outside the cave. As we piled stones on the cairn, it felt like a eulogy for Sarah, and maybe for ourselves, too. Standing there, under the harsh Badlands sun, we made a silent vow. Not of vengeance, not exactly. But of defiance. We wouldn't let the darkness extinguish us, wouldn't let fear dictate our lives. The aftermath is a scar the three of us carry, an invisible bond forged in shared trauma. The creature still lurks out there, I'm sure of it. We never saw it again but that sense of something terrible waiting in the shadows never fully left. Sarah's disappearance is a cold case, one of many on the reservation. Tyson carries the heaviest burden. Sometimes there's a faraway look in his eyes, and I know he's back there, facing the monster, over and over. Reyna channeled her pain into action, studying tribal lore, Seeking knowledge the elders hesitated to share about creatures that exist on the fringes of the known world. I became a tracker, learning to read the signs the land whispers, hoping to one day find a way to protect my people from the dangers hidden within it. Life, in a strange way, goes on. We grew up, found jobs, had families of our own. Yet, the weight of that secret, the memory of that fateful summer, is always with us. It surfaces in nightmares, in the flicker of unease when shadows stretch long in the twilight, in the way we warn our children be careful where you wander, respect the old ways, 
for the world holds both beauty and teeth. My name is Tavio Whitehorse, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened when I was 22, a few years after I finished college and had moved back home to the Navajo Nation. We have a ways out piece of land that's been in the family for generations. My great grand used to run sheep out there, now it's mostly just me going out to hunt or hike and find some peace and quiet. It's a good 20 miles north of Window Rock, Arizona, rugged, arid country, red rock mesas rising up in the distance, and those endless stretches of sagebrush in between. I always loved exploring the backcountry, getting off the beaten path. That particular weekend, I was feeling a bit restless. It had been blazing hot, the kind of heat that bakes the ambition right out of you. But by the late afternoon, some storm clouds were rolling in from the west, and that familiar itch got me. I grabbed my pack, slung my old lever action Winchester over my shoulder, and hopped in my beat up truck. The drive out was bumpy as hell, and it wasn't until the sun was starting to dip below the horizon that I parked and started my trek. The air was still heavy, but with the scent of rain hanging on it. Now, I know what you might be thinking, dumb college boy, heading out alone as a thunderstorm bruise? It wasn't ideal, but hey, I figured I'd find some high ground to hunker down for the night and wait it out. Besides, I had that sense you get when you're out in the vastness of the desert, that mix of feeling totally alone yet incredibly connected to the land. I hiked until it was almost dark, then started looking for a good spot. I came across this shallow canyon cut into the rock by an ancient wash. Plenty of places to scramble up out of the way of rainwater if those clouds decided to break. I got myself settled in, had a bite of jerky and watched the lightning flash in the far distance. Now here's the thing, there's nothing quite like a desert storm. The vastness of the sky, the way those flashes illuminate the clouds, it's almost a spiritual experience. The rumbling thunder felt like a primal kind of music echoing in the bones of the earth itself. It was while I was caught up in this little show that I saw it. A flash of movement against the dark, lower edge of the clouds. At first, I assumed it was a huge bird, maybe a vulture. But this thing wasn't circling, it moved in a straight, purposeful line and vanished behind a nearby mesa. Curiosity peaked. A moment later it reappeared, heading straight for me. And that's when I realized my mistake. This was no bird. It was too big, the silhouette all wrong. Even in the gloom, I could see the long legs, the loping gait, the head held low, like some demonic wolf. But wolves don't get that big. It kept getting closer, its eyes reflecting the distant flashes of lightning, like two burning embers. I froze, heart pounding in my chest. This felt wrong, all off kilter. My instincts told me this wasn't a regular predator, there was something intelligent about its movements, something eerily deliberate. Then I remembered the old stories, whispers of the skinwalker, the Navajo witch who could shapeshift into creatures of nightmares. My great-gran had told me those tales, but I'd always dismissed them as folklore designed to keep us kids from wandering off at night. Yet, staring at this beast approaching through the thickening rain, I had a sickening feeling. I knew I had to make a run for it. If I could get up onto the mesa, I'd have the high ground, maybe by myself some time. I dropped my pack and bolted towards a steep, eroded spot that might give me a scramble up. 
The creature must have sensed my movement because it let out a sound that froze my blood. It wasn't a snarl or a howl, but something guttural and distorted, almost human. And horrifyingly, it sounded like a cruel, echoing laughter. Panic propelled me up the slope, my feet slipping, my fingers grasping at any crevice or outcrop I could find. Thorns tore at my hands, but I didn't care. The creature was gaining on me fast. I was almost at the top when my boots slipped on some loose shale. I tumbled backwards, scrabbling for a handhold, but finding nothing. I landed hard on my back, the air whooshing out of my lungs. Pain exploded in my ankle, and for a moment the world was a jumble of rock and swirling storm clouds. When I managed to get my bearings, I saw it. The creature stood on the edge of the mesa, silhouetted against the streaks of lightning. Now that it was closer, I could see its details clearly, and my stomach turned. Its fur was matted and coarse, patchy in some places, revealing scabby skin. It was grotesquely thin, bones jutting out through its flesh. Its eyes glowed with that terrible, malevolent light, and its mouth was pulled up in a grotesque grin, showcasing a row of broken, yellow fangs. It cocked its head, studying me as if I were a curious insect. Then it dropped onto all fours, its movements sickeningly fluid and disturbingly quick. I scrambled back, dragging myself along despite the searing pain in my ankle. I fumbled for the rifle, but it had been flung clear when I'd fallen. The sense of dread was overwhelming, a visceral certainty that this was where I would die. The creature launched itself down, landing in front of me with a thud that shook the ground. It advanced, slowly circling me, savoring my terror. Desperate, I scrambled for any weapon I could find. My hand closed around a sharp, jagged rock, and I raised it, a puny shield against this monstrosity. It let out another eerie chuckle and lunged. I swung the rock wildly, aiming for its head. It connected with a sickening crack, and the creature let out a yelp of pain. My surge of unexpected hope was short-lived. It shook off the blow, those terrible eyes burning with rage now. It raised a clawed paw, poised to strike. I braced myself for the impact closing my eyes and letting out a yell of defiance born from sheer terror. The blow never came. Instead, I heard a gunshot echo through the canyon, sharp and startling. The creature flinched, whipping its head around. Another shot followed, and this time it let out a howl of pain. My eyes flew open. There, standing on a ledge high above me, was a figure holding a rifle. I couldn't make out his face in the dim light, but something about his silhouette felt familiar. Tavio! Get out of there, the figure shouted, and my jaw dropped. Dad? It couldn't be, and yet. He fired another shot, and the creature snarled, finally retreating a few steps. Move, son. My dad had somehow sensed I was in trouble. Old habits, maybe, a father's instinct he couldn't shake, even though I wasn't a little boy anymore. I struggled to my feet, my injured ankle sending jolts of agony through my body, but fueled by adrenaline, I somehow managed to limp away. Another shot. Then another. Each one drove the creature back a little further. It hesitated, glaring at my dad, then with a final snarl, it turned and vanished into the darkness and the deepening rain. I collapsed against the canyon wall, breathing heavily, barely believing I was alive. My dad scrambled down the slope and was beside me in seconds. His face was a mixture of worry and relief. 
Are you hurt? He asked, voice hoarse. Just, just my ankle, I stammered. He helped me to my feet, supporting my weight as we limped back towards my truck. What the hell was that thing? I finally managed to ask. My dad shook his head, eyes narrowed. I don't know for sure. But it was no ordinary animal. We got back to the truck just as the downpour started. I huddled inside, shivering from shock, while my dad tended to my sprained ankle. We didn't talk much on the drive back home, both still processing what had just happened. When we pulled up to the house, my mom rushed out. One look at my face must have told her something was very wrong. We spilled out the story between the two of us, and her face went pale. She pulled out her old silver necklace, the one with a turquoise stone set in it. You need to wear this, Tavio, she insisted. For protection. I'd always thought it was a bit of harmless superstition. But that night, I put it on without a word of protest. Over the next few weeks, I went back out to the canyon with my dad several times. We looked for tracks, for any sign of the creature, but we found nothing. It was as if it had disappeared into the storm itself, leaving nothing but a nightmare echoing in my memory. The experience changed me. I started taking the old stories more seriously. I spent long hours with my grandmother, listening to her knowledge of the land, the warnings she'd always given me. There was a depth and a weight to her words now that I'd never fully grasped before. Word of what happened got around the reservation, it's hard to keep something like that a secret in a close-knit community. But nobody had ever encountered anything quite like what I had described. It was added to the lore, another tale told in hushed whispers around campfires, the story of Tavio and the Skinwalker. I didn't like being the center of that kind of attention, but I found a sort of grim comfort in knowing that I wasn't alone. We still don't know what was out there that night. I don't like to think about it for too long, not out of fear, but out of respect for the unknown. There are forces in this world we don't fully understand, and maybe it's best to leave some things in the shadows where they belong. The land out near the canyon still calls to me. Sometimes I think I catch a glimpse of those burning eyes in the darkness, or the echo of that terrible laughter in the howl of the wind. But it always fades away, leaving me wondering how much is real, and how much is the aftermath of a night when I brushed up against something truly monstrous, and lived to tell the tale. My name is Ben Sandoval, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened back when I was in high school, living in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. Lush forests, deep canyons, the kind of place where you could convince yourself Bigfoot wasn't just some silly legend, that is if you didn't have half a brain. Me, I was all about fishing, hanging with the guys and trying to pass chemistry without blowing up the lab. The usual. Summers up there could get brutal. The kind of dry, blistering heat that makes you feel like roadkill. The one saving grace, as far as I was concerned, was the river that snaked its way through the valley floor a few miles down from where I lived. Even on the worst of days, the icy water and the shade of the trees made it halfway bearable. So, the day the weirdness started, it wasn't any different. Me, my best buddy Rylan, and our pal Jonah were headed out for an afternoon of fishing and screwing around. Rylan's dad owned a little cabin tucked back into the trees upstream from the usual swimming spot, and since his folks were off on some fancy trip, We'd scored the keys. 
figured some burgers cooked over an open fire beat the heck out of microwaved whatever at home. We piled into Ryland's dad's beat-up truck and bounced down the dirt road, windows down and old country tunes blasting to drown out Jonah's off-key singing. Rylan was driving, naturally, since his dad barely trusted him to ride a bike, let alone handle a truck. Still, we made it to the cabin without incident, which counts as a win around these parts. The cabin was old, but solid, built back in his grandpa's day. It had that woodsy smell, and the back porch overlooked the river where sunlight dappled through the leaves. Perfect spot to chill, even if the fishing ended up being a bust. We set up our gear, bickering over the best lures the whole way. Now, that stretch of river wasn't known for big catches, mostly sunfish, the occasional skinny trout. But the thrill was in the chase, right? After a few hours messing around, we hadn't had much luck. Just when we were about to call it quits, in true fisherman fashion deciding one last cast was the key, Jonah let out a whoop. His rod bent double, the line singing taut through the water. Finally. A monster, I bet. He shouted, grinning like he won the lottery. Rylan and I rushed over half expecting the line to snap and send him tumbling headfirst into the river. His usual luck. Instead, the fight began. Jonah grunted with the effort of reeling in, every muscle in his scrawny frame tense. Whatever he'd hooked wasn't your average fish. It thrashed and pulled, dragging the line downstream. Whoa! Help! Jonah yelled, sweat plastering his blonde hair to his forehead. Rylan grabbed the net, and I waited in alongside Jonah, heart pounding in my chest. This was turning into something way more epic than our usual haul. The water swirled and churned. Then, for a fleeting moment, we saw it. A flash of silver scales, so big it couldn't be a trout a shape that darted under the surface just as fast as it appeared. An eerie prickling ran down my spine, a gut feeling that told me this was wrong. Whoa, what the? Rylan trailed off, his usual smirk fading. There was a tension in the air, something heavy and unsettling. We weren't alone. I wasn't sure if the others felt it but the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. That old, primal instinct that signals danger. Jonah fought with the unseen creature, and we got the first clear glimpse of it. It broke the surface momentarily, a massive head with a gaping, toothy maw. It was reptilian, with cold, bulbous eyes and slimy scaled skin that rippled with an unnatural, oily sheen. Then, a blur of motion. The thing surged, powerful enough to yank Jonah off his feet. He hit the water hard, the fishing rod flying from his hands. I dove in instinctively, adrenaline surging through me. His head bobbed back up, eyes wide with terror, the current pulling him relentlessly downstream. Rylan was shouting, scrambling along the bank. He reached out, fingers straining desperately, but Jonah was already too far, carried away like a leaf in a storm. The sight of his bobbing head amidst the swirling water chilled me deeper than the icy river ever could. Jonah! I choked out, scrambling to swim back to shore. It was useless, the current had him in its relentless grip. We ran downstream, stumbling over rocks, our panicked shouts echoing through the canyon. Then, a bend in the river. The water swirled into a deep pool, shadowed by overarching trees. Jonah was gone. Vanished as suddenly as though he'd never existed. 
Rylan dropped to his knees, his face pale. Terror and despair twisted in my own gut. We searched. Called for help. But deep down, we knew. It was no accident. Something lurking in the depths had taken him. In the aftermath, things were a nightmare. Police, search parties, whispering townsfolk with their wild theories and pitying looks. No trace of Jonah was ever found. His disappearance became one of those stories, the kind people talk about in hushed tones around campfires. The monster in the river. The adults dismissed it, animal attack, flash flood, whatever they could say to soothe their own fears. Rylan and I knew better. We saw it, felt the wrongness of that place. It wasn't natural, whatever lurked below the surface. After that, I avoided the river. The thought of its shadow depths churned my stomach. I started hearing those old stories folks like to tell, legends about creatures that live in hidden places, taking those foolish enough to stray from the path. The kind of tales your rational mind scoffs at, but that cling to the dark corners of your memory, gnawing away at your peace. Years passed. Life moved on, in the way it does. I left for college, got a job, tried to build a life far away from whispering pines and rushing water. Yet, even now, the memory of that day returns in flashes, the thrashing in the water, the slick scaled form disappearing into the depths, my friend's panicked eyes just before he vanished. Some folks might say I'm crazy, or making things up for attention. They're entitled to their disbelief. But the thing about monsters, the real kind, is that they don't care if you believe in them or not. They exist in the shadows, in the unseen spaces, and sometimes, just sometimes, they drag the light away with them. My name is Coda Whitehawk, and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened years back, when I was a teenager growing up on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Life on the res is hard, a fact I knew better than most. My mom passed when I was a kid, and dad, well, the bottle was his closest companion. But I had my grandma, and I had the wide open land. Days filled with exploring, nights with grandma telling the old stories around a crackling fire, that's how I found myself. One summer, when I was 16 or so, the heat clung to the land like a wet blanket. Everything seemed to slow down, even the chatter of the prairie dogs echoing across the grasslands. The gang at school had taken to hanging out at Jumping Rock Creek, a spot where the water pooled deep enough for a decent swim, so I figured it was better than stewing in my room. My buddy Leo and his cousins, twin girls Corinne and Karina, were already there when I arrived, splashing and laughing. Leo was a lanky kid, always quick with a joke. The girls were inseparable, two sides of the same mischievous coin. They all were family in the way that counts, the kind that binds you even tighter than blood sometimes. After a while of cooling off and goofing around, their grandma called them home, leaving me and Leo to ourselves. We sprawled out on a flat rock, the sun burning down on us. It was so peaceful, listening to the water rushing over the stones, the buzzing of dragonflies. Hey, Coda, Leo broke the silence, you ever hear the stories about the creature folks say lives in these parts? I shrugged. Sure, Grandma used to tell him. Monsters and shapeshifters, that kind of thing. Never took him seriously. Leo grinned, his white teeth flashing against his sun-brown skin. Maybe you should. 
friend of my uncle saw something weird, down by the creek near the old ruins. Said it moved in the shadows, fast, but wasn't no animal he recognized. We fell into a comfortable silence again. Leo's stories could get a little tall sometimes, so I usually took them with a pinch of salt. But I couldn't deny a prickle of unease down my spine. The elders didn't spin those tales for nothing. There's a reason they warned you to stick to familiar paths after dark. So, what you gonna do? Hunt it down? I scoffed, trying to lighten the mood. Something flickered in Leo's eyes. Nah, too much work. But, it'd be kinda wild to see, you know? He shot me a challenging look. That was Leo, always chasing adventure, trouble usually following close behind. And hey, I wouldn't admit it out loud, but a part of me was curious, too. We laid there under the unforgiving sun, the only sound the relentless hum of insects, and a wild idea started to take root. By the time dusk settled, painting the sky in streaks of purple and orange, we'd hatched a plan. Not a smart plan, looking back, but when you're young and restless, sometimes reckless seems a lot more fun than reasonable. We'd scout the spot at night, see if we could catch a glimpse of whatever Leo's uncle thought he saw. Just a peek, then head home. So, as darkness fell heavy as a buffalo hide cloak, we snuck back to the creek armed with flashlights, hearts pounding with a mix of anticipation and nerves. The ruins Leo mentioned were a short walk from the swimming hole, crumbling walls of an old homestead, half swallowed by overgrown weeds. The night air thrummed with unseen life. Crickets chirped, and all hooted distantly, but every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, set my senses on high alert. My grandma's stories flooded back, filling the darkness with half-remembered shapes and whispers. We searched the ruins first, shining our flashlights into every shadowed corner. Nothing but crumbling stone and the skittering of startled mice. Still, my skin crawled with the certainty of being watched. Leo, bless his stubborn spirit, wouldn't give up so easily. Let's check the creek bed, he whispered, his eyes glinting with excitement. He moved with a silent ease that came from years roaming the wilds. I hesitated, a sense of dread settling in my stomach, but a stubborn pride, a refusal to seem afraid in front of my friend, pushed me forward. The creek was a ribbon of silver in the moonlight, the water murmuring softly. Leo made his way towards a stand of cottonwoods, their pale branches reaching like skeletal fingers in the dimness. I trailed after him, my pulse quickening. And that's when I saw the eyes. Two pinpricks of amber light glowing from beneath the trees. Low to the ground, unnaturally large. A guttural growl, like boulders grinding together, rumbled out of the darkness. My blood turned to ice. Leo froze beside me. In the thin moonlight, I made out a hulking form massive shoulders, a long, powerful body crouched low. Its skin glistened, not with fur, but like slick, wet scales. For a terrifying second, it was motionless. Then it exploded from the shadows, speed that defied its size. Ron. The word was torn from my throat. We turned and bolted, branches whipping at our faces, our terror-filled gasps echoing in the night. My legs pumped, every instinct screaming at me to escape, but the thing was gaining. I could hear its ragged breaths, smell a foul, swampy odor hot on my heels. I stumbled, sprawling face first onto the stony ground. Pain flared in my knees and palms, but before I could scramble up, 
an immense weight slammed into my back, knocking the air from my lungs. I thrashed wildly, a desperate animal caught in a predator's jaws. The creature's growl vibrated through me. A clawed hand, inhumanely large, pinned me down, and fetid breath washed over my face. I glimpsed a gaping maw lined with razor teeth before my world exploded in pain as it clamped its jaws around my shoulder. Through a haze of agony, I heard Leo screaming, not in fear, but in fury. Something smashed into the creature hard enough to jostle it. My vision swam, but I saw Leo wielding a thick branch, raining blows down on the creature's back with raw desperation. The creature hissed, releasing me. Still dazed, I saw a flash of scales and teeth as it lunged for Leo. He stumbled backward, and all at once, the thing was gone, vanished into the darkness as abruptly as it appeared. My name is Mateo Sandoval and this is the folklore story that I want to share with you today. It happened years ago, back when I was just a kid on the Navajo Nation Reservation in Arizona. A wild, beautiful place, canyons like gashes across the desert, mesas rising up towards the wide open sky. It's a land of ancient stories, where spirits walk alongside the living, and the boundaries between worlds can sometimes blur. My childhood was filled with exploring those rugged landscapes. I loved scrambling through hidden arroyos and chasing lizards across the slick rock. Back then, my biggest concern was beating my little sister, Elena, home for dinner. I wasn't afraid of much, maybe just the dark and the occasional grumpy rattlesnake. One brutally hot summer, a new kid, Kai, showed up at the reservation school. He was from some big city, Chicago, if I remember right. He talked fast and didn't understand the rhythm of life on the res, which made him an easy target for teasing. But there was something about him, a spark of defiance, that made me want to see what he was about. Turns out, he loved exploring just as much as I did. Elena, of course, insisted on tagging along. She was younger but fierce, never one to back down from a challenge. So, the three of us became an inseparable trio, bound by a shared love of adventure and a healthy dose of mischief. One scorching August afternoon, with the adults seeking respite indoors, we decided to follow a dry creek bed that wound deeper into the canyons than we'd ever ventured. The thought of finding hidden pools of cool water spur us on. The deeper we trekked, the more the landscape changed. The canyon walls narrowed, casting strange, elongated shadows. The air grew cooler, almost damp, despite the unrelenting heat. It felt wrong, out of balance. Maybe we should turn back, Elena's voice was small, a rare admission of uncertainty. Kai, however, was undeterred. With a defiant gleam in his eyes, he gestured further down the canyon. Look! A cave, he pointed at a dark opening just ahead. The promise of the unknown outweighed caution. We pushed on. The cave mouth gaped wide, an invitation into the earth's coolness. Inside, the air was musty and still, the dimness pierced only by the weak beams from our dollar store flashlights. The walls were smooth, almost polished, and the floor littered with rocks and debris. There was a strange echo in the space, as if our voices bounced off something unseen. Deeper into the cave, the rock beneath our feet grew slick. A faint, sour smell hung in the air, like rotting meat and something earthy, something old. Then, Kai let out a startled yelp. 
His flashlight beam had landed on something glistening and smooth at the far end of a narrow passageway. My stomach clenched with an instinctive, primeval dread. He moved closer, and as the light focused, a collective gasp escaped us. There, laid out on the cavern floor, was a skeleton. Not an animal skeleton, though. The skull was elongated, the ribcage wider, and the bones looked impossibly heavy. My mind fumbled for an explanation, scrambling for something rational, anything normal. Poacher? Lost hiker? But as we moved cautiously closer, we saw them. Two glowing, red eyes materialized within the skeleton, flaring with terrible life. Elena screamed, dropping her flashlight, and pure, unreasoning terror shot through me. The monstrous, skeletal creature lurched to its feet, scales shifting in the meter light, a low, rasping growl emanating from its grotesque skull. There wasn't time for thought, only reaction. We spun and ran, scrambling back through the narrow passage, clawing at the smooth rock walls. My heart pounded in my ears, drowning out the creature's echoing bellow and the sound of its claws on stone behind us. Elena stumbled, and I reached back to yank her to her feet, but it was too late. The creature's hand grasped her ankle, its touch icy, its talons biting into her flesh. Her scream cut through the chaos as she was dragged backward into the darkness. Kai and I reached the cave entrance and stumbled into the blinding sunlight, Elena's agonized cries fading into the bowels of the earth. Collapsing against the red rock wall, I let out a strangled sob, my entire body trembling uncontrollability. Kai pulled his knees to his chest, his usual bravado replaced by a hollow look of shock. Finally, he spoke, his voice shaky. What was that, thing? I shook my head, unable to find words for the horror. That night, Elena didn't come home for dinner. Her absence echoed louder than any scream. The adults searched. They found traces of a struggle at the cave entrance, and Elena's flashlight smashed on the ground. But of Elena herself, or the monstrous creature, there was no sign. They called in park rangers, even the police, but the canyon held its secrets tight. The official explanation was a mountain lion attack. Easier to swallow, I suppose, than a tale of skeletal monsters lurking in hidden caves. But Kai and I knew the truth. We knew the thing we'd seen was something far more dangerous, something far less explainable. Something tied to the old stories, to the shadows that lurked just beyond the firelight. 